Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our State of the Net panel on revising Section 230, what proposals are on the table. Um, just by way of a quick introduction, um, you know, Section 230s was a once obscure provision of telecommunications law, and it has, of course, in recent years, taken center stage in the debate about society's relationship with the internet. And uh, President Trump famously called for its repeal. He even threatened to veto a major defense bill over it. President Biden, while he was a candidate, agreed on the need for change. Last Congress, we saw over 20 bills introduced uh, to change or eliminate Section 230 or address some of the issues that it raises. And uh, last Congress, many people were skeptical about whether Section 230 legislation could pass. This year, it feels different. The stakes are higher, the coalition's broader, the issues that it raises are even more central to our society. So uh, to paraphrase the Truman Show, how's it all gonna end? <laughs> Repeal, replace, amend, how do we sort through all the many proposals that are on the table? Uh, luckily, here to help us answer these questions, we have an all-star cast of experts. Uh, their bios are largely available online, um, uh, but let me quickly introduce our panel. We've got uh, Professor Ellen Goodman, from Rutgers Law School in the, my great home state of New Jersey, Professor Olivier Sylvain from the Fordham University School of Law, Professor Genevieve Lakier from the University of Chicago Law School, and Professor Eric Goldman from Santa Clara University School of Law. Before we start, just two very quick program notes. Uh, first of all, we will save some time at the end for questions, which we will collect via Zoom. So please, uh, so I should say from audience questions. So please uh, look for that link at the bottom and especially towards the bottom of the hour, please feel free to, to, to send us your questions. Uh, second thing, I just really wanna do just a very brief shout out to the Internet Education Foundation. Uh, for those who don't know, for, for really almost 20 years, IEF has been offering very high quality crafted programs that help shed light on the really tough debates surrounding the internet. And I just wanted to congratulate IEF and Tim Lorden on this 17th State of the Net. And it's fitting that we're here today as a group discussing what is also really one of the very tough problems facing the internet in section uh, 230 and what to do about it. Okay, with that, let's dive in with our panel. Uh, I'll start by saying, you know, painting with a broad brush, there are arguably three big approaches, three main approaches here uh, when we're talking about Section 230. One is to, you know, leave things as they are, uh, the status quo. Uh, a second is uh, some have called for a really just a, an outright repeal of Section 230. And then there's a large bucket of um, ideas around amending uh, Section 230 or other provisions of law to achieve the goal, our goals in this space. So to start with our panel, I thought I'd ask, you know, what do you all, taking this first piece about just the status quo, you know, what do you all think are the most important arguments today for change, for amending or eliminating Section 230? And uh, what's wrong with the status quo? And I'll start with Professor Goodman, um, who's written quite a bit about this, and maybe you can you can start us off. Um, okay, so I think, you know, often what gets conflated, and it's hard even to know which of these you're asking, Alan, is what's wrong with social media or what's wrong with Section 230? Um, so let me start with the first question, the larger question, and then, you know, we'll funnel it down to the knocks on Section 230. Um, and I think it's an important distinction because most of what's wrong, I think, with social media cannot be solved by reforming Section 230. Um, so I think there are three general problems uh, that people have identified with social media. Um, it's that the platforms are overly powerful. They act capriciously to silence voices or to promote them. Um, the second problem is that their business model is uh, uh, based on massive personal data collection or surveillance capitalism, however you want to put it, micro-targeting, engagement. Um, so they have design flaws. Uh, that exacerbate polarization and, and elevate um, uh, harmful uh, speech and other information uh, and other conduct. Um, and then the third problem is that the platforms act irresponsibly um, 
partly because of their business model, but also because they're responding to political pressure and they lack care to mitigate um, the harms that they cause. And I think these problems all point in different directions, sometimes to antitrust or ex ante rules about concentration. They point to privacy law reforms. They point to liability, um, specifically Section 230 reform and also to regulation. Now, of all of those problems, you know, this Section 230 is a smaller, um, uh, there, there are narrower critiques about Section 230. And I think really they sort of fall into two categories. One is that um, Section 230 creates moral hazard and, and, you know, has ballooned well beyond its original intent because of the development of the industry. Um, and then the second is, you know, I think also a more general problem in sort of First Amendment law, which maybe we can hear from Genevieve on, um, is that it, it treats all online activity as free expression worthy of protection um, and fails to distinguish uh, what is really conduct from speech. So I think um, those are the problems and I'll, we'll, we'll hear from others about um, the taxonomy, I think in that, in your third group of reform proposals. Alan, can I? Um, can I? Yes, please, in? Professor Sylvain, go go ahead. Um, thank you, and uh, please call me Olivier. Um, so uh, I'm uh, I, I, I pre very much appreciate uh, the way that Alan has set this out, um, and it's a you know kind of comprehensive way of thinking about our information environment, um, and it, another way of of of, of arguing um, that we should slow our roll on on two thirty a bit. Um, I don't think she's gone as far as to say that, but that's part of uh, the point. Um, I, I'm, I'm among those who've been pushing for a role in this regard um, far more than um, we've seen. And the one thing that I would add to the way in which um, uh, Alan just talked about it is that it, it, with regards to the status quo, there is there are very few, if any other, regulatory environments in which entities are immune for causing moral hazard, right? For causing externalities for which they don't have to bear the cost. Um, and uh, I mean, I'd love to hear if there are, if I'm wrong about that, but this is, this is the sort of thing that I think is core and important. So when we're talking about reform, um, this isn't, you know, the status quo is a remarkable situation where um, the, the costs, the social costs, have never been borne by these companies. Now, it's it's th this idea arises from a very um, sensible and and romantic conception of what the information market looked like in the 1990s, and that these entities would be able to regulate themselves. Right, the the safe harbor is meant to encourage self regulation. Um, but we are now, in light of the business model that Ellen just talked about, in a different world, and it's taken the stuff we've seen in the past month really the past year, and I've been writing about this for the past three years, um, to kind of raise our eyebrows uh, on this. So I want to underscore this. And one more point, Alan, I want to, you, you, I should have, you know, you, you identified some of these, these, the three buckets. I don't think one of these is on the table. The, the next time I'm thinking about stays on the table, but it, it arguably could be. Um, one of the things that I've written about well before this current discussion about statutory reform is the role that the courts have in this space. Uh, and in fact, after the court, after the Ninth Circuit kind of reformed, and reformed, but elaborated its view about how to determine whether an intermediary is contributing um, to the harmful content, the, you know, the courts have been a little more alert to whether they're materially contrib contributing. And my argument is that the way they design their services does that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk more about this, but I say that because courts are becoming more alert to this. And even the chief judge of the Second Circuit, um, who's retiring, um, Judge Katzman observed as much in the dissenting opinion in Force versus Facebook. Great point. Um, uh, we we're talking about the courts where the First Amendment is implicated here. And uh, Professor Lake here, although uh, Olivia has now put us all on a first name basis. Genevieve, if you uh, <laughs> wouldn't mind jumping in, I'd love uh, your, your views on this question. And also, uh, uh, as Ellen asked, you know, sort of where the First Amendment plays in here. Well, okay, great, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say something in response to uh, the point that Olivier made about how there is this problem of mor moral hazard on the platforms. Um, and I'm sympathetic to that point. So I am no, f I will just say, I'm no fan of section 230 because um, I'm a first amendment scholar, I'm a free speech scholar. 
Mm, and I'm interested in thinking about uh, questions of power as they relate to free speech. I think we don't have a vibrant democratic public sphere unless we protect the speech of the powerless as well as the speech of the powerful. And I have this longstanding beef against contemporary First Amendment law because I think it just reinforces existing property and power relations in a bad way. And so, but maybe when thinking about Section 230, it's useful to be thinking in these terms. What Section 230 is, is it's a grant of power to these powerful tech companies that run these platforms to make decisions about speech regulation, both take down and keep up uh, decisions without facing legal li liability. And uh, it is intended both to give them the ability to take down when they, you know, the Good Samaritan idea. Uh, but I think also there is this strong free speech overlay where it's uh, one of the hopes is to promote and ensure that if, you know, corporate lawyers fear of legal liability is not going to lead to overly sensorial or oppressive practices by the platforms. And I think we should be worried about that. Um, and so when thinking about Section 230 reform, I think one of the um, objectives, what I want to be more a part of the debate than it is, is to think about how to reshape the power dynamics on social media. Because one of the concerns about many of the platforms that I have, uh, many of the proposals that are on the table, is they don't do anything to rein in the power of the platforms when it comes to regulating speech. They simply say, um, you know, you will have more legal liability if you don't take down speech, and therefore they're um, there's a lack of parallelism. They're imposing liability if they take down, but they're not constraining, uh, sorry, if, if the platforms keep up, but they're not constraining their power to take down arbitrarily um, without much justification or in a discriminatory way. And so when thinking about the problem of bad speech or morally hazardous speech on the platforms, I think we also have to keep in mind that whatever proposals, reforms we embrace to deal with that problem have to be paired with some kind of protection against uh, discrimination, censorship, just bad decision-making by the platforms. And many of the proposals to reform 230 are, uh, are not, I think, sufficiently sensitive to that concern. Uh, maybe this is a good moment to uh, also start to bring in the conversation around one of the big proposals that is out there, which is simply repealing Section 230, right? Um, that's the other end of the spectrum that I mentioned. And it is actually the subject of two the last two bills that were introduced in the previous uh, Congress and Senate uh, were um, were simply repeal bills. Um, maybe uh, uh, Eric, uh, uh, you can um, uh, jump in for us and uh, uh, give us a sense of what would be wrong. Start us on the conversation. What would be wrong with that? <laughs> uh, why not just do repeal? Uh, thank you, Alan, and thank you to the State of the Net organizers for putting this conversation together. Um, I'm in the school of um, thought that uh, uh, I favor uh, continuing uh, to support Section 230 as opposed to repealing it or reforming it. Um, and there's a few reasons why. Um, I think the most important thing uh, that we ought to consider is um, how much Section 230 underlays the, uh, the things that we love the most about the internet, uh, the things that we do on a daily basis, the, um, uh, the, the uh, ways in which it has uh, uh, given us benefits on an hour by hour, minute by minute basis. So anywhere from the social media services that we all use um, and many of us enjoy uh, to, uh, to online shopping uh, in marketplaces, to uh, getting uh, services like uh, Wikipedia, uh, to gain uh, reviews like uh, uh, services like consumer reviews. These are all things that, that don't exist in the offline world that Section 230 has enabled. And so anyone who's per discussing repeal um, is really saying, let's let's put all of that in play. Let's let's reshape the internet fundamentally um, on the things that we use on an hour by hour, minute by minute basis, and potentially let's get rid of all of them. So to me, repeal really isn't shouldn't even be part of the conversation. It's really saying let's recast the entire internet in a different format. Um, and that, I find that conversation particularly odd, uh, given that. Um, we just are in the middle of a pandemic where we have shifted many of our major institutions into an online equivalent. And that online equivalent, um, in many cases, depends on Section 230, including this conversation that we're having right now today on Zoom, um, exists because Section 230 enables Zoom to provide these services to us. So um, when we're talking about repealing Section 230, we're also saying, 
let's go ahead and, and step back the ability uh, to transform our institutions to an online equivalent. Let's go back and, and to a physical world where we put all of ourselves at risk uh, with each other. Um, and I think that the most important question for anyone who advocates repeal is to answer, what problem do you think you're solving? And it's my general view, something I hope will amplify throughout this conversation, that whatever problem people think they're gonna solve, section two there is actually probably the solution, not the source of the problem. And I do agree with Ellen when she said, whatever objections you have to social media, section two there is not gonna fix them. And really I think so much of the reason why Olivier favors slowing Congress's role is because we are not clear what problem we're gonna solve and that we aren't confident that we actually uh, uh, are doing so by targeting section 230. And that's, I, I hope, I think the discipline that we can get in this conversation, show me the problem, then let's make sure Section 230 uh, reform is the fix. Anybody else want to chime in here on just this, this issue of repeal? And the reason I think it is important, I mean, we, you know, came close in December, right? You know, I mean, it was, we had a major veto threat of an extremely important bill, uh, defense bill that, you know, that might have, that, that, that arguably hinged on, an, act, an absolute repeal, straight up repeal, uh, elimination of Section 230. Um, what would the implications of that be? I think if you folks could maybe spell them out a little bit more, uh, probably be helpful. I see well, Olivia. I mean, okay. I, maybe Ellen, you can go and I'll go after you. Well, I mean, so I'm not for repeal. I am for reform. Um, sure. And and I would say, you know, it, it's, and it reminds me, you know, we could have been having this discussion about the chemical industry in the 50s or 60s, right? They, they do so much good and, and like we don't want to kill that industry, but they also do a lot of harm, right? And, and so, you know, if you're, if you're so the argument that the poster child for what would happen if you killed Section 230 or even significantly reformed it is that you'd lose Yelp, right? And I, and I do think that's a significant danger. Um, on the other hand, you know, we also just had an insurrection and um, at the Capitol, which was significantly, you know, now. So then that's the good question. Would that be, you know, if that's the boogeyman that we're trying to avoid, sort of mass radicalization um, and offline harms, uh, does, would reforming Section 230 do anything about that? And there, you know, that's where I'm a little skeptical. But what I do think is that um, I agree with Genevieve about the power relationships, although I do think that some of the 230 re proposals do address um, some of the power imbalances, um, and we can talk about that. Um, but I also think, you know, just as an old, like, regulatory lawyer, um, sometimes just having the 230 cudgel out there um, gets a lot more self-regulation than it sort of reminds me of the filibuster, you know, negotiation. It's like it needs to, it needs to be out there, that and other things. Um, in order to have to, to bring the platforms to the table. Olivier? Yeah, um, I, I want to, uh, I mean, I, I'm actually, uh, there are some bills uh, on the Hill that I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I'm very supportive of. And, and so, uh, I, you know, I, I want to, I hope we get there that speak to some of the issues that um, Genevieve raised with regards to power, uh, as Alan has said. Um, uh, on, on the question of repeal, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very wary of such a thing, uh, at least because I worry about startups, right? And, and you, you envision the burdens imposed on them. Uh, on the other hand, I'm, I'm, on, this, on this panel, I'm pretty sure I'm the one that's probably the most open to that possibility because I don't think it's completely right. I mean, I'm not, that's not where, that's, I, don't, I don't lead with that, right? But I don't, I, don't, I don't, there are mechanisms in law that would have been available, but for Section 230, right? And what the courts decide after 230 is passed in its interpretation of the language of 230C1 is that distributor liability um, is, a, 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 is, is also the sort of thing that is, is protected. Distributor liability would impose obligations on, on entities that have notice that there's bad stuff happening on their website. So, so I mean, I do think things like Yelp would be endangered. I, I mean, maybe I, I'm, I'm likely. I, I believe the, the the Yelp as we know it is is likely not to be around um, without 230. But but there are mechanisms in law that existed to address the third party liability um, that we you know for what it's worth. So a repeal doesn't mean like there's there's a full onslaught of of regulation. There are careful there are there's a tort regime that exists to address it. Well. Let me follow up with you then uh, just quickly that uh, as we sort of think about what the other 
good legislative proposals out there that might be more in the, as several have said, the reform, not repeal camp. And in fact, somebody on our chat already called us out for setting up a straw man of just <laughs> status quo versus uh, uh, repeal. And I, I agree. I think that is uh, a straw man. I think we're more likely to end up with there are many, many ideas on the table. So Olivia, let me, let me turn, to, since you just mentioned it, you know, what are some of your favorites among these legislative proposals? Um, what do you think are the most promising uh, that we should be talking about? Um, well, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful that we open this up. I mean, I, I am. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. The, the, among other things, I mean, I was thinking in particular, I don't know, if, Ellen, this is what you were thinking about, but there are distinctions in the, um, in the PACT Act and uh, w which is um, uh, Senator Schatz's um, contribution to the debate that makes distinctions between big companies and small ones. That is those that have fewer than 1 million users and those that, are, that have more than them. Um, also as a matter of annual re revenue, 25 million um, is the cutoff point. And that, they would, and, and that cutoff would, 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 um, would de determine um, the transparency requirements and the legal process that um, the companies would entitle users to in the event they, their, their contents would take it down. Um, I, I think that's sensible and the sort of thing that we see across public law. And I think Genevieve would speak directly to your concern about power uh, and also speak to what I think Eric agrees that, you know, this is, this is a sort of provision that helps startups um, um, to, to compete with, with incumbents. So those are, those are actually things I think many people are, are on the same page on conservatives, uh, you know, liberals and people who are, you know, absolutist about 230 exception, about the 230 protection and those like me who, who have been very worried about it. Genevieve, did you want to jump in? I mean, I'm actually, I also am somewhat, I don't mind. I think the PACT Act is interesting in part because it's focusing on uh, procedural uh, requirements, uh, transparency requirements, uh, information forcing requirements. I mean, the thing about how Section 230 has been implemented right now is it's created these like gigantically powerful uh, immune in certain ways, not from federal criminal law and not from copyright, but immune in many ways, legally immune companies that have not been very transparent about their decisions when it comes to speech regulation, that don't give a lot of due process rights and that have just been free to do what they want. And I have to say, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the companies. I mean, the scale of speech regulation that's occurring on these platforms outstrips anything in that you know the courts have to deal with. And these speech regulation decisions are happening very fast all around the world. I think it's actually very difficult for the companies to be doing this in any kind of sensible way. But that only um, reinforces the need for there to be some kind of legislation that provides some kind of guidance, minimum due process and procedural requirements. And so um, like Olivia, I think that that's very interesting, uh, but that's not, that's, that's about trying to take this opportunity to um, improve the democratic transparent nature of the platforms. It's not, um, the, um, what I worry about more are the reform proposals that are simply about um, cutting out certain kinds of speech from the immunity that section 230 right now uh, provides. That seems like only um, uh, worsening to some degree, this real worry that I have about discriminatory and arbitrary takedowns. So just to follow up, that would be more like what we saw with the FOSTA-SESTA debate, where we um, looked at, you know, particular kinds of harm, uh, speech-related particular kinds of harm. Uh, and, you know, people have talked about now expanding that approach to, uh, uh, you know, removing those Section 230 protections or changing Section 230 protections for things like opioids or... Um, uh, uh, child sexual abuse material. I think there are other there are other categories that have been proposed. Is that wh what are the what's the you know that is that is something that's been proposed. What what do you think the limits of that are? Or the implications of that are? Why and, not go that way? Yeah. And also, I think there's a proposal out there about um, a ter terrorist um, activities, things that violate right. terrorism laws. And I just I understand, and it seems to me, given the politics of the current moment after the Capitol invasion that that's good. there's gonna be a lot of sort of political energy behind these kinds of reforms. And so this is why I'm totally behind Ellen's idea of slowing the roll, because I worry that anything that happens immediately, if the thing uh, are only going to, in some ways, increase the platform's power when it comes to taking down, um, imposing due process, transparency requirements, 
uh, information um, sort of research, opening up their data to researchers requirements. These are going to be costly for the platforms. And I, I think politically, it's just going to be harder. I'm no policy wonk. Uh, but it seems like this is a time to take, this is a period when we should be worried about immediate reforms that seem very um, attractive. And with all of these um, reforms, you know, I, uh, I think the faster SESTA uh, history should give us real pause. There's a lot of criticisms that, the, that it didn't solve any problems or made the lives and um, uh, safety of sex workers much worse. Um, and also just um, encourages the platforms to be have a broad brush when they're taking content down. So I think we should be worried about all of these. Alan, you've uh, you've written uh, actually last year a great uh, terrific taxonomy of sorts of sort of the the various approaches that have been put out there. It's actually been a lot even since that paper that you wrote. Um, Thoughts on what uh, which of these which of the proposals are most promising, or also you know which which others that we should be taking note of. Um, well, a new one. I think a new one since then, although this category was in there, were were interventions with the business model, um, and and especially around um, you know I guess you could say it's it's uh, the question of of when the platforms are. Um, through their algorithms, essentially creating content, right? So it's the, it's the content um, content um, distinction. And so here it's Malinowski and Eshoo's um, bail. And Olivia had mentioned the Force versus um, Facebook case and, and Judge Katzman's dissent. And I think that's what they're trying, sort of trying to implement in this in this act. Um, I, Alan, should I should I give a short should I summarize that case? Yeah, that'd be great. Please okay. do. Um, so, so that was a case where uh, a family force was was suing um, Facebook because their I think their child had been um, the victim of a of a terror attack, and the perpetrator of that attack um, had been sort of introduced to his circle, had been radicalized um, through a recommend a Facebook friend recommendation. And so, um, and, and Section 230 applied. And I think, you know, Eric has written a really good um, critique of, of Judge Katzman's dissent in that case. So, and, and you know, it's on the law, um, Judge Katzman, I think, was wrong under existing law. So Judge Katzman said, um, no, you know, here Facebook is sort of acting as a, as a content creator because they're recommending friends. And that should be outside the scope of Section 230, and I think under existing law, that's not true, but so what this bill tries to do is make that law. Um, so what the bill tries to do is to say when a platform is, I think it's amplifying, um, algorithmically amplifying or recommending, um, uh, uh, maybe monetizing, I can't remember if that's part of the bill, um, but uh, but then they will be outside um, the shield. And, and so I you know, I like the spirit of that proposal um, because it gets at this, uh, yeah, um, you know, I think it sort of gets at platform power. It gets at the business model. Um, it creates moral hazard for amplifying. Uh, the problem is that I don't know how to operationalize it. I don't know how to define those terms. Um, I don't know how, as a litigant, as a litigant um, you would be able to show that your harm was traceable to an ampli to the amplification as opposed to some sort of organic spread, um, and I don't that, that people may uh, may know um, how to do that. I, I suspect that you would need a regulatory sort of the FTC um, to to create you know some some sort of um, to, put, to put flesh on those bones. Can I jump, jump in just to talk a little bit yeah, about please. the issues here? <laughs> well, because I think that's super interesting as well. I really like that Katzman dissent. Um, um, and it's pretty clever, right? Because the idea is that we want to immunize platforms from the liabilities that publishers had. And this is something that traditional book publishers didn't do. This should be outside the scope of 230. It seems it's a, seems like a really clever way of talking about, uh, getting to what is novel about the social media environment without forcing us to make platforms act as if they are book publishers when they're not, or newspapers, I think would be the ordinary analogy. But okay, but the worry is, and I also think from a theoretical perspective, if it is in fact the case that it's simply that they have civil liability for causing harm through these decisions, that shouldn't raise a first or criminal liability, whatever it may be, it shouldn't raise a First Amendment issue because they already have that liability. The First Amendment issue is with uh, issue would be with the underlying laws that they are being held accountable to. 
But if in operationalizing it, there has to be some government body that says these are the practices that the editorial practices, the um, um, uh, you know, platform curating practices that are okay or not okay. And of course the platforms are gonna to wanna to know this so that they can avoid liability under this law. I think all of a sudden it starts to look like the government is determining the editorial choices that platforms can make. And under the first amendment, as far as we understand it right now, and I think this is likely how the courts would interpret it, the first amendment immunizes platforms as well as other kinds of um, hosts, property owners who host speech forums from any interference with their editorial choices. And so I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about 230. I think uh, that reform uh, bill does get at platform power and maybe identifies what is particularly harmful about the platforms when it comes to their regulation of speech. But I just think it raises all kinds of difficult First Amendment questions. Yeah, Alan, if I can jump in here. Please. Uh, I'd appreciate it. Um, first of all, I think that um, it's helpful to understand in the Forrest versus Facebook case that um, similar cases have failed on non-Section 230 grounds. They failed on the statutory elements. They failed on tort principles of causation and they failed on the First Amendment. Um, and this really gets straight to the heart of what problem are you trying to solve? If you think that uh, amending Section 230 will fix whatever problem you identify in the Forest versus Facebook case, you need to understand that you're probably running into a buzzsaw of other problems and Section 234 won't actually help. Um, and uh, and I, I think that um, uh, so much of the discussion that, that I'm hearing between Alan and Genevieve really is getting into issues that raise some, some really problematic questions about the First Amendment. Um, when we talk about things like amplification of content, I don't understand what amplification means. To me, that's called publishing content. Um, anytime that you publish content, by definition, you raise the profile of some content in, in priority to whatever didn't get published. Um, and so if publishing content is subject to congressional regulation, that sounds like a First Amendment problem. Uh, Genevieve even mentioned things like um, uh, information forcing processes. And I guess my question for you, Genevieve, um, back in the 1970s, when newspapers had local monopolies in their metro area, would you have supported a, um, uh, um, uh, uh, addressing the power that they had by forcing them to produce more information? And would that have been constitutional? And uh, I, I'm hoping I can get the answer to that because um, uh, because I think that really gets at the heart of the question. Are we, are we um, approaching this with the idea these internet services are something other than um, uh, publishers of third-party content, which gives us free reign to discuss a whole range of regulatory inventions that if we were to apply it to newspapers circa 1975, or we were to apply it to any other publisher of content, uh, Genevieve, you mentioned book publishers, we would say, of course you can't do that. You cannot tell publishers how to run their operations. So it, um, with your permission, would it be okay if Genevieve could, could at least tell me, do you think that this is something that you, the solutions you're proposing now are identical to what you would have favored circa 1975? Uh, okay, uh, several responses. So one is, I mean, public, you know, there's a certain kind of um, nominalism to is this publishing or something else. The fact is that the social media platforms are regulating speech, they're acting in the speech marketplace, our media environment, in a different way than newspapers operate and booksellers operate and town criers operate. They're a new technology um, with new economic and institutional forms. And so they regulate speech in different ways. And so I am not a person who thinks that the First Amendment means that we just must uh, mechanically apply the same rules to different to um, different kinds of actors. The purpose of the First Amendment is to facilitate and protect a vibrant, diverse, and inclusive democratic public debate. And I, so I think we should be attentive to the differences uh, between social media companies and booksellers, uh, which is not to say that we shouldn't take the First Amendment issues here seriously. I take them very seriously. In terms of information forcing, you know, I think one reason why Section 230 keeps coming in to conversations, even conversations that don't seem really about Section 230. So for example, um, the desire to create more due process uh, when it comes to social media or more transparency, it's not really about carving immunity out or right, the, uh, the suggestion, I think this is in the PACT Act as well, to ask the platforms to open up their, uh, give information to researchers or to participate in a kind of, I think a, a, some kind of oversight, digital oversight body. Um, I think in those contexts, we can think, 
um, what Section 230 is doing is it's serving as the carrot or the stick that's trying to incentivize the, the companies to voluntarily engage in, um, give information, engage in good behavior that maybe they wouldn't be able to constitutionally be required to do. I think that raises lots of questions about whether Section 230 is going to work in that way, uh, but that's one thought. Would I have thought uh, during, to, ask you, to answer your question specifically, during the period when newspapers were monopolies, if they could give information to local regulators so that the regulators could regulate them more effectively. I mean, so I'll just say, and this is a, I think a um, reflection of the fact that newspapers just operate differently. I don't exactly know what information regulators would have needed to do, to, to have. Um, but um, I think that the turn that the court took in the seventies to think that there could be no um, constraints on the editorial freedom of even powerful newspaper monopolies uh, was a mistake. And so maybe you and I just disagree about the ongoing um, First Amendment values here. Alan, I'd like to come in. Yeah, please. Um, there are a bunch of things that have been said that I have, haven't, um, I haven't had the opportunity to weigh in on. Um, and I'm going to take liberty and answer part of the question that Eric addressed to Genevieve. Um, it is absolutely bonkers to me to compare the 1975 information environment to what, was, what is happening now. And um, okay, bonkers is not fair. I think that it is not <laughs> correct to do that um, because uh, what we have in this environment is something far different. And I wanna talk about amplification, right? And, 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 and talk about this as a matter of conduct, not speech. This is kind of bizarre um, romanticization of the content that is trafficking through these con companies as if it is speech, right? Um, Genevieve appears in a, in a great Emily Bazelon piece uh, today where this issue comes up uh, in the context of the way in which the Supreme Court has enlarged a conception of what is protected speech. But, but, but never mind if I'm, never mind if, you know, this is not conduct. Let's talk, talk about alg amplification, which is what the, the um, Malinowski bill is addressed to. Uh, and and I, I want to talk about something that is in a different setting. So, so um, with regards to force versus Facebook, that was a terrorism case and the underlying statute the material support statute. If there is no problem here, um, why not allow 230 to go, you know, if, if, if the material support standard is never met by plaintiffs under the underlying statute, why worry about 230? Um, but more than that, there are a variety of other settings that underscore what amplification entails. And I was writing two or three years ago about um, automated decision-making systems that these um, intermediaries rely on to distribute content in ways that are never, never been possible before and that speakers themselves didn't, didn't know how to make possible. And the cases I talked about were in the context of housing discrimination made, in, made possible on Facebook's ad manager. And how do they do this? How does Facebook do this? They first um, um, get a, a customer list from the advertiser, and then they enlarge it um, by, looking, by creating lookalike audiences. Okay, that's something that is beyond the pale for anything, never mind the 1970s, beyond the pale of what most people are doing today. And they also deliver this content to people who are likely to get it. Right, they're likeliest to be most interested in it. And Facebook is making that decision. No one else is making that decision. That is what amplification entails. That does not look like speech to me. That looks like, that to me looks like material contribution. What's interesting is that plaintiffs brought this case after the markup, did a wonderful series of um, studies and, and pieces from 2016 to 2018. They um, led to a case that was filed by civil rights groups against Facebook's ad manager. And Facebook settled the case we never got to find out what material contribution looks like, whether amplification like this is allowed. And, and for me to, to, to associate this kind of commercial activity with what is happening in the seventies is not right. And one more thing, Alan, I, I didn't get to yeah. weigh in on what the other carve outs were. I mean, there are arguments for the, you know, about current bills and why there might be problems with carve outs. Um, for what it's worth, we see carve outs in, all, in, in a variety of areas of law. We see it in tax, we see it in copyright. Um, it isn't among them is, is so you, you mentioned the FOSTA uh, phenomenon, the Hirona bill that is floating out these days, Senator Hirona bill is addressed to civil rights violations, which by the way, are not protected speech. Like you can't, there's some, some things you can't say, right. Um, in housing markets, defamation is always the sort of thing you can't say, but wrongful, any activity that leads to wrongful death, any trust suits, suits for um, injunctive relief. I mean, this is what the carve outs entail. And that is actually, 
far closer to what is happening in DC. And I, and I, I suspect we'll talk more about that um, later. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for that. Yes, and Alan, I was going to turn to you as well. And uh, please jump right in. I want to say something. I, I don't think we've covered this, um, which goes to the newspaper issue, but it's really about culture. And I think, you know, law is downstream of culture. And if we look at what the newspaper industry looked like in the 70s, and I think this is embedded in the Cronillo decision and also in the, in the New York Times versus Sullivan decision, there were certain assumptions about how newspapers operated. And so, um, you know, first of all, newspapers had mastheads and, and bylines, and they separated, you know, not only news from opinion. And so those were their cultural practices not encoded in law. Um, and that conveyed a lot of information. Also, they were regulated because the FCC had all sorts of ownership policies um, that tried to, that, that recognized the monopoly power of newspapers, and so then didn't let um, them merge with with broadcasting companies. And so, you know, that was a, 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 an orthogonal mode of regulation that didn't actually apply to the newspapers. Um, but I think that, um, I, you know, one of, when we talk about, and so, so the online companies grew up without any of this culture, right? They come from a completely different culture and not from the media culture. And so it's only been very recently that they've acknowledged any kind of responsibility um, in the way that newspapers, you know, for either, um, Either they acknowledged it or they were afraid, they, they were sort of bound in a regulatory culture, which although it didn't apply to them, they operated in the shadow of it. And so I think that, um, you know, among, in addition to the, yeah. to the distinctions that Olivier draws, this sort of cultural distinction is really important. I, I want to make sure we have a few minutes to get to our questions, but just really quickly, we've, um, just in terms of things we've touched on, we've talked about the, the pluses and minuses of outright repeal and concerns there. We've talked about the PACT Act and the transparency and moderation requirements. We've talked about the carve outs uh, as an idea, uh, sort of like SESTA, both the potential First Amendment concerns and as Olivier mentioned, places where this is not First Amendment protected uh, uh, speech necessarily. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about amplification um, and monetization and, and the Eshoo Malinowski bill. Is there anything else that folks want to put on the table just to flag before I turn to questions quickly uh, uh, as, as promising things we should all be looking at? Well, another, we haven't yet mentioned it, and it was, it was the first, I think, major um, effort, bipartisan effort is in that, at, in the, of the past year, and that is the, the Earn It Act, um, right? Um, that basically draws on work of Daniel Citron and Ben Wittes um, there, um, the, the immunity or the safe harbor would be contingent on intermediaries taking reasonable steps in good faith to take content down. Um, I mean, there's more to it, um, but, but that's the basic idea. And I just thought maybe just for the, for, to be a little more comprehensive, that, that was, that, that I think was the first major, you know, by ostensibly bipartisan effort. Right. I'm sorry, just to clarify, the PACT Act did strip out any notion of trying to condition uh, good behavior as a pre prerequisite. It just was re uh, a uh, categorical content carve out. Yeah. And by the way, I was referencing the PACT Act in part to just really more of this, uh, the idea behind it around uh, focusing on transparency and moderation, um, content moderation practices. Uh, there are other elements of PACT Act for sure. Um, let me, there were, there's a whole set of questions in our Q&A. We won't get to all of them. Um, let me see if I can pull out a couple of them. One, one question was about how, if we're talking about doing this, how you, how, uh, if we're talking about reform, how do we address how reforms can be enacted at scale? Um, and I think that that goes both to uh, recognizing the scope of people who would be impacted by the reforms or changes. And also we've touched on this enforcement issue how does enforce? Let me throw in. How does enforcement happen here? Do we have the capacity for enforcement uh, around this? How? What do we need to do there too? Any takers? I guess I'm not sure I understand the question fully, but I guess uh, I'd start with the um, uh, the challenge to anyone who uh, thinks that they can tell uh, a Google or Facebook how to run their content moderation operations. 
whether they're going to do what you think they'll do based on the regulation or if they're going to do something that you didn't expect or in fact actually the opposite so for example if you do a small business carve out google and facebook are still um uh, are are not are no longer have section 230 but everyone else does um what do they do at that point um uh, you know, one scenario, the most likely scenario is that they simply uh, remove content much more freely. Is that what you wanted? Um, ask that question. Um, that's going to be the lowest cost avoidance technique for them. Um, but another scenario is they just shut conversations down. They, they, don't, they don't remove content post hoc. They simply shut the conversations down and carve up pieces of their business and say, these are no longer tenable. Um, and so, you know, anyone who, who wants to talk about what will reform look like at scale needs to game out what are the counter moves that the uh, internet services are going to make that it'll be in their self-interest under this scenario. And as Genevieve mentioned, FOSTA SESTA is a great predictor about this. A bunch of things that happened from FOSTA SESTA were not what Congress thought it was going to get. It was actually the opposite. Another question from the audience. Oh, sorry, Genevieve, go ahead. Because I think that's a really important point. And I will just say, I feel like when people are talking about Section 230 um, and sort of carve outs and uh, how to reform uh, the regulatory practices, I don't know if they're thinking enough about how these this, these choices, speech choices happen on the ground. Like um, there are tens of thousands of people employed to make uh, Im immediate decisions about whether a particular act of speech is going to raise liability for the company or is in otherwise against its terms of services. And so the concern I have is not that the companies are not gonna take down what is in fact legally prohibited speech or speech that is defamatory or whatever. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about all those split second decisions in which people are gonna be having to figure out whether or not there's the risk of liability. And so I do think another way in which social media companies are just different from newspapers is the scale of the speech for good. I mean, we have a much more democratized public sphere than we used to have. There's lots more people speaking. This is all really wonderful. But it does mean that when we're thinking about asking any decision maker to figure out whether speech is permitted or not permitted, the scale of the speech flowing through the platforms is going to make these de decisions really quick and maybe quick and dirty. And so we should worry about that. I'll, I'll say, oh, sh go ahead, go ahead, Olivia. Yeah. Go to the Q and A, but I, I want to associate myself with the comments that both Genevieve and Eric have made on this. And I think it's important for me to say that, by the way, because of how hot these things can be. I completely agree that that there are unintended consequences that we might worry about. And when FOSTA SESTA was written, it it looked shaky from the beginning, right? And people were expressing that concern. Content addressed directly to content, right? Never mind that. I mean, there may really be some First Amendment concerns there. Um, so, so I want to associate myself with that uh, for what it's worth. Okay, I'm told we have just two or three minutes, a couple of three minutes left. I'm going to throw in one more question from the audience, and we'll go to a quick lightning round. Um, the question was about uh, whether there's anything that we can learn from Europe, uh, which has uh, uh, just gone through multi-year process to propose the Digital Services Act there. Uh, they do things that include, you know, treating different players in the stack, like uh, ISPs are treated differently from, say, social media companies. Uh, they also have, a, for example, which some of the bills that we've seen uh, include um, different treatment for very large platforms versus small platforms. Any of this sound good to folks? Anything else we can learn from Europe? Any takers? I have a comment on that. Um, two things that we can learn from Europe. One is that uh, almost all of the global innovation when it comes to user-generated content services comes from here in the United States. Um, and so Europe, I think, has categorically uh, um, uh, been okay with the idea that they're uh, discouraging that kind of innovation. Um, so you know, if you want a model where we have less user-generated content services, Europe proposes that model. Um, but I think we have a better here. That's my view. Um, the other thing we can learn from Europe um, is based on things like the GDPR, um, how the GDPR actually has uh, uh, solidified um, the, uh, the power and uh, market uh, presence of Google and Facebook uh, and hurt uh, its, their competitors. Um, I think that many of the reforms are being posed in Europe and that have been implemented actually continue to give Google and Facebook greater uh, con control and then that creates the downstream problems. Well, what do we do about the fact that Google and Facebook are in control? Well, it all started with the, the regulatory environment that, that helped build a competitive moat around their services. Yeah. Olivier? Um, real quickly, you know, so last December, the European Commission adopted 
some proposals addressed to this, right? And, and one of them that I think we're seeing in the PACT Act, it's differently formed, um, but it's from Europe, is um, imposing an obligation on intermediaries to take down content that, that a court has decreed is unlawful, right? Under current law in the United States, that's not the case, right? So um, yep. to me, that's kind of like a no brainer. The other, the other um, point that we haven't yet talked about, with, and this is, this is addressed to your question about scale, um, the PACT Act, um, I, I mean, I like the Hirono bill a, a lot too, but we, and we've been talking about the PACT Act a lot. The PACT Act creates an opportunity for government agencies, not lay people, but government agencies to bring lawsuit, not without worry about the 230 defense. And what are we yeah. talking about? We're talking about the Department of Justice, HUD, the Federal Elections Commission, right? Um, now I could see why this would worry people for the same reasons we've heard, but um, uh, you know, for what it's worth, these are public regulating authorities and either we have a problem with them or not. Quick lightning round for to, to close us out here and we'll go in the opposite order from the first, the way we started. So Eric, you're, you'll be up first. So if you were advising a member of Congress or their staff, uh, some of them might be listening, uh, what would you suggest that they focus on in the next few months of drafting bills and putting hearings together? Very quickly, less than 30 seconds. Eric. Yeah, I think that they should focus on the right factual baseline, um, that we're never going to eliminate antisocial behavior in our society. And so trying to hold internet services to a higher standard uh, is unrealistic and ultimately is gonna fail. I think that we should also embrace the notion that we in the United States are global leaders on free speech. Some, something that we gave a lot of ground on in the last four years. And when we target section 230 and discuss how to regulate publication of content online, what we're really doing is signaling to the rest of the world, that's okay. And the rest of the world is watching us. Genevieve, what would you suggest? Oh, uh, well, I'm a free speech person, so I have a very free speechy answer, which is that it seems to me that there's that the conversation about how to regulate uh, speech on social media is uh, still in its early stages. The platforms themselves are changing their views about what how what to take down, what to keep up all the time. And my concern is I want the public to be involved and there to be some kind of public buy-in. And so the focus I think right now is to ensuring that there is sufficient flow of information from the platforms to the people and back so that we can continue to have a vibrant discussion and that it's not just, which it is right now, these um, non-transparent corporate players making all the crucial speech regulation decisions for all of us. Olivier? Um, 30 seconds. Uh, so um, I think, you know, so I'll, I'll be at the 30,000 foot level. It's a point I've made elsewhere. Uh, what can you do sitting in this chamber that engenders a sense of civic responsibility where it's been missing? What can you do? And among other things, you might want to think about the most important kinds of speech acts, if we're going to allow ourselves to call these speech acts. Um, uh, and, and that are consistent with the operation of democracy. And I think this is a nice um, segue to the kinds of things that Alan has started with, and maybe she can say more about. Alan, bring us home. You, uh, you have the last word here. Okay, so because this isn't budget reconciliation, it's got to be bipartisan. And so I would say three things. There are two low-hanging fruits, transparency and um, data portability, which we haven't talked about, but I think there's bipartisan support for both of those. And then the bigger um, uh, idea, which I do think there would be bipartisan is to open up the Public Broadcasting Act and make it the Public Media Act and support um, high quality information and other kinds of civic, uh, uh, civic responsibility and engagement. Well, this was terrific. And I hope everyone will join me in a, a rowdy round of virtual applause for our panelists. And uh, thanks to all of you in the audience and the terrific questions that came in. I hope we'll, uh, they, they, they are their terrific uh, record of our conversation in a lot of ways. And uh, again, Thank you for uh, thank you to IEF and the State of the Net Conference for hosting this, and again to our panelists for such a thoughtful conversation. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you.